All right, thank you so very, very much. Um, if we can, let's go back to Leviticus uh, chapter number 19 tonight. Leviticus 19. I hope you'll stay with us. We're going to have a, a time of fellowship back in the activity center. Actually, let's go to chapter 18 and we'll just speak a word about this morning. We, we mentioned this that you have uh, the phrase, I am the Lord, or I am the Lord your God, 163 times in the Old Testament. Uh, the mo majority of those, 60 some is in the book of Ezekiel, 45 of them in the book of Leviticus. And in these two chapters, chapters 18 and 19, probably 21 times uh, we have this phrase. I, I want you to notice what the Lord is trying to emphasize. Let's just highlight a little bit, 18.1. Notice it please, if you would. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwell, shall ye what? Not, not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, shall ye not. not do. Neither walk ye in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments, keep my ordinances, to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Uh, chapter 18 again is uh, all kinds of references to fidelity and marital relationships. We go to chapter number 19. He deals with all different kinds of relationships. Remember 19.1. Let's start there for a moment. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, Ye shall be holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. And then we have these litany that we went over this morning um, of all of the I am the Lord's, verse 3, verse 4, verse 10, verse 12, verse 14, and right on down through the chapter. And we spent time with this emphasis, and I know that it was a strong one, that the Lord is not saying, I am the Lord your God, to identify himself. The Lord is saying, I am the Lord your God, because he's reminding them of his authority. He is secondly reminding them in chapter number 19 uh, that he is the one that brought them out from Egypt. And the picture is because of the redemption I've given you, taken out of the world because of who I am. I want to help you. I, I want you to honor me. I want you to be my people. But we boiled all of that down that sometimes we need, not sometimes, but certainly all the time, we as God's people, no matter who we are, struggle with sin. Every man, every woman, every young person, we struggle with sin. And it comes to us in rainbow attacks of all different kinds of flavor, all different kinds of sizes. And as it comes, as we go through the daily grind of year after year after year after year, we can begin to wane in some of the things that we've held and believe. And not that we, we leave the belief, but we begin to leave the behavior that has been affected by our belief. And, and what we have right here is the bedrock reason of the fences that are put up. And the bedrock reason for the fences that are put up that we do not sin, I am the Lord your God. You see, there's some decisions that change our lives <coughs> completely. There are some decisions that affect our lives for the good.
And if we are the children of God, if the salvation of trust that we have in him is, is beating, as it were, in our spiritual heart, I don't know about you, but there are times that hurts and frustrations and burdens and attack can come. And sometimes what will hold us is I am yours. I remember Dr. Dolphus Price uh, back in the 80s had actually a tent meeting here. We had a tent crusade. Several of the churches joined together over here at the Frederick County Fairgrounds. He was successful. His son went on to pastor a huge church in Charlotte. And he had a son that was 16. And I'll never forget him sharing when he was 16. He said the devil got on his back and never left him go. And he said, I'm so thankful for the time that he came to me. He, Adolphus was about 5'4", okay, and about 300 pounds, all right? And he said, when my son, who overshadowed me, came and hugged me as a 16-year-old boy and said, I'm so glad. Because of you, Dad, I know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. That was so important because two to three months later, he was shot and killed. He said, when I had to went to inquire about that, he said, well, which, which boy are you talking about? There was two killed that night in the town. And he said, I went home. I walked into my bedroom, and I unlocked my gun cabinet. I got the shotgun out, and I loaded it. And I headed out the door. And he said, I got about halfway out through the lawn, when the Spirit of God said to me, where are you going? You are mine. Amen. And through tears and weeping, I unloaded that gun, took it back in the house, and of course, bore through the frustration and hurt and heartache and, and, and having our life shattered of losing a son. There are some things that we have that God gives us that, that is to keep us. And I think that we are so foolish to believe because you are a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, or a Wednesday evening Christian because you help at church um, because, Pastor Steve, because you're involved in ministry, there's just certain things you won't ever do. In the past two weeks, someone I love has had to step out of the ministry and they'll never step back in. Maybe the greatest example of this is the angelic host before creation itself. Before, before Lucifer led them. Just, just think about this for a minute. Do you understand that back then they did have a free will? At the cross, when Jesus died and purchased our salvation, they became elect angels. The angels can never fall again. <clears throat> Think what they experienced. They were in the presence of God. They saw his majesty. <clears throat> They saw who he was. They saw the splendor of God. Certainly they saw him create to a certain degree. They were in absolute perfection. The Garden of Eden for angels, if you would. And they fell. They fell. May I say, if that's the case for them, because we assume if we're in this right atmosphere, perfect atmosphere, and because we're doing it pretty right, and we ought to be where, you know, we, we are where we are, that somehow we think that we're insulated from falling. That's just not the case.
they stepped over a line they could never go back from. Let me give you tonight just a couple of constraining considerations, if you would, uh, from the Bible that we face and, and things that maybe um, we could adjust into our lives and maybe recognize as it were. And I, I want to go back, if you would, you're in chapter <coughs> Leviticus 19. <clears throat> and I mentioned this this morning, it's one of the I am the Lord's, it's in verse, chapter 19 and verse number 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of my people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor. This is Old Testament. Thou shalt love thy neighbor. This is Old Testament. I'm not reading from the Queen James here. Okay. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. One of the things that is right before us and that we all deal with, that we all face, is hurt, grudges, things that we carry, bitterness um, toward those that are close to us, toward other believers, toward those that are out, without, it could be within our own family. Um, those things are hard. And yet the Lord is very clear here. Let me go ahead and read the verse again. Thou shalt not avenge. Do you know vengeance is right, but only in God's Amen. hand? Nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Um, obviously, it, 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 this verse comes up because it would feel like we have a right to do this. There are certain things that have come into my life, how about yours, that I absolutely feel like I have a right to respond to. Now, can I, can I hasten to say that I, I do believe that God does give some exceptions. I think Paul appealed um, more than once to the legal system exercising his right Right, so there are things that can happen, and we should we should deal with things legally and respond to them, upholding justice, punishing wrongdoers, protecting the innocent. There are things that legally we should be involved in. But I, I don't know an area, maybe more, that we, we struggle with than offenses that come our way that become very, 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 very uh, difficult uh, to deal with. Notice, if you would please, again, let's go to the book of Hebrews 11. Um, this passage is obviously one that we're uh, familiar with, but I want you to notice <clears throat> a verse of Scripture here. It says in Hebrews 11 and verse 15, And surely if they had been mindful of the country... From whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country. Verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. I could add this verse to it, and it would be, it would be um, this. By faith Abraham, when he was called remember Genesis 12, to go out to a place which he should, which he should after receive for inheritance, he obeyed and he went out, listen to this, not knowing whether he went. 
not knowing whether he went. Number two, a consideration is this. When we cannot see the outcome of doing what God commands. When we cannot see the outcome of doing what God commands. Abraham could not see this outcome. He simply said, I want you to go out. And he, it literally says, he went out not knowing whether he went. Wow. That's, that's, that's pretty powerful. Do you know in Genesis 22 when he was going to offer up Isaac, Paul tells us and gives us the indication about that passage that it seems like Abraham really believed he was going to kill his son and that God was going to raise him again from the dead. In these instances, and there are so many others in Scripture and many in our lives, God can ask us to do some things and make some decisions and we don't understand the outcome. We don't know the outcome. We don't know where it's going. I remember when uh, Jay Sprecher uh, left Keystone to go west and I sat down and have a talk with him and uh, only the way that Jay could, he laughed about it and said, I don't know. I don't know. I just know God's told me to do this. There were some things I wanted to take care of. And the Lord said, no, I want you to go now. He goes, okay, I'm going to go now. Those times happen in our lives. Somebody would say, that's blind obedience. Well, if I know that God wants me to do something, even if I don't know the outcome, then that kind of blind obedience is virtuous. would be to God we would always obey when God asked us to do something and we don't know the outcome of those things. God asks us to do some things and we don't have a present understanding of why. Do you remember Peter? Jesus was washing their feet and well, what, what did Peter say? You're not going to wash my feet, etc., etc. And uh, the Lord said, listen, if I don't wash your feet, you're not going to part of me at all. But he never explained fully why. You know, there's, there's situations in the Gospels again and again where the Lord does certain things and he doesn't explain fully why. He asks us to live by faith on some of those things. In other words, what do we do when we can't see the outcome? We follow the Lord. Remember this one, Peter, um, <clears throat> that is in the tanner's house, isn't it? He's up on the roof praying, and it says he almost falls into a trance, and a sheet is dropped and said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Three times, and boy, he gets out of there and says, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything unclean. The Lord says, I want you to do. And remember, then we have Gentiles, Cornelius, and the men come for Cornelius, and he's going to follow them, what? And embrace the Gentiles, which he would have never done without the illustration of um, eating that which he thought was unclean. He didn't understand it, but he obeyed God. We shared with this, you with this, this with you the other week. We do not leave God for what we know because there's something we don't understand. We don't leave God for what we know for if there's something we don't understand. And there will be things you don't understand. Amen. There are things in Scripture, the Bible tells us, that are hard for us to grasp and understand. Let's go just for a moment back to uh, Genesis um, oh, let's go back to Genesis 39 for a moment. <clears throat> Here's another one. Sometimes we are faced with situations that are pure disobedience. But they can come upon the most godly believer. We come to chapter 39 and verse 1, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and 
Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian brought him out of the hands of the Israelites, bought him out of the hands of the Israelites, which had <clears throat> brought him down thither. Remember this? And the Lord was with him, and he was a prosperous man, as he went in the house of his master, the Egyptian. In other words, he was there, he submitted. And God began to elevate him, began to prosper him. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he had to prosper in his hand. Twice we have that in the passage. <clears throat> Verse 4, And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put into his hand. Here we have the New Testament fulfilled. The Lord says, humble yourself. You humble yourself and let me lift you up. Here is a man that is a servant, the spirit of a servant. We know that he's a godly man. The Bible says that the Lord is with him. We know what happens. This man's wife sets his eyes on him and will not let it go. Do you understand that it was satanically inspired, I believe? But let's just go to the verse for a moment. <clears throat> verse 9, <clears throat> verse 8, verse 8, But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in his house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then, here it is, here's this standard, I am the Lord. How then I can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass as he spake to Joseph day by day, when he hearkened, he hearkened not unto her to lie with her. And we know what happens. He finally flees, doesn't he? He runs and flees. Understand that my particular understanding, my particular reading into the passage is this. The reason that he ran, because if he wouldn't have, he would have fell into temptation. It had gotten to that place. It had gotten, if you would, to that line. Here is a man doing what's right, and what? God allows him to be tempted with what is nothing more than pure, rebellious, sinful temptation, and he flees. What's the bottom line of all of that? I am the Lord your God. There are situations that come into our life where we, he was assaulted with temptation. The situation against him was weaponized. What, what, what keeps us in a time like that? I am the Lord Amen. your God. Let's turn to Luke 5. I know I'm running you back and forth here a little bit. Maybe we should have had a Bible drill, huh? Teenagers, would you have won? Luke 5. This is the Lord. As is with Peter. We remember the story of him and the fishes launch out into the deep. Notice verse 4, 5, 4. And when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and we have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let down the net. Here's another one. When our experience argues against what God is telling us to do. When our experience is arguing against what God is telling us to do. Here he is. His life is going to be absolutely changed. He is saying, I have tried all of that. I know that. Um, and the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. 
We have situations like this with our giving. We have situations like this with our time. We have situations that surround us where our experience argues against what the Lord is telling us to do. And the truth is, it's our unbelief. And we don't want to say that in 2024 in an independent, fundamental, premillennial, right? Rapture-believing Baptist church. But it is our unbelief very often here that we struggle with. For time's sake, let's move to John 21 and I'll finish this. These things are not always pleasant, but they're sometimes the realities in our life. Jesus here is speaking. And in verses 15, 16, 17, John 21, 15, 16, 17, he is saying to Peter, feed my sheep. Three times. It's a, a response uh, to his failure before the cross. And notice what he says. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself. And Peter, you walkest wherever thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old in your service of me, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry there whither us, whither thou wouldest not. He was telling Peter. He just committed to serving him. The time is going to come when men are going to handle you and do things that would be against your will. And of course, Peter was crucified upside down. What, what are you saying, Pastor? Follow me even though it can be dark, and it can be sometimes. God was telling Peter, you're going to suffer. And to Peter's praise, he moved right ahead serving the Lord. But he also does this. Verse 19. He is looking for a little easy out here, and he spake. This he spake signifying by what death he should die to glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved. Who are we talking about here? John. Following. Which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? And Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? God's given a direction to Peter's life that it's going to be dark at the end. Certainly the Lord's presence will be there. And Peter's like, but what about him? What's he going to do? Jesus said unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Folks, this is really strong. The Lord steps out and says, what's happening in his life is my business. Amen. Amen. He is saying, if I will that John follow me. Because we can get so burdened and caught up in what happens in the lives of others' people. What's going to happen in others? And that contrast against us. Sometimes it can get dark. I'm glad for all the positive truth in the Bible. But I'm also glad that there's a Gibraltar of truth. Because the Christian life isn't all a bed of roses. And the Christian life isn't always about something good is about to happen to you. 
There are hard times and there are valleys that we have to go through. And each one of you that sit under the sound of my voice are going to have to go through that time when you are going to decide either when you're going to lose all of your health or your money or your finances or your relationship or one of the hardest things that's ever happened to you in your life, exactly who you're going to serve. Sometimes it, it bothers me when I see other assemblies, and sometimes quite large, that are of a different persuasion than us, that are always dealing with the something good is about to happen to you. Because I know that all of those people are going to have to deal with the reality of darkness sometime. And very often what happens, it collapses their faith. And so thank the Lord for all the mountaintops. Praise him for all of those things. But we almost understand, we must also understand these truths. I'm going to finish with this verse, Psalm 119, 4, and we're done. <clears throat> Psalm 119, and verse 4. Psalm 119, verse 4. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts. And what's that word? Diligently. Diligently. We must respond to what the Lord has commanded us. And then he says, all that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Why? Because my heart doesn't want to do that. Lord, help me come tonight and, 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 and turn my heart that I want to embrace your word and I want to live for you. And God, you do it through me because I can't do it for myself. But God, help me embrace this truth down in my soul that thou art the Lord, my God. That we could walk and live and obey in those areas. And I hope after the morning's message and the evening's message that, that you would leave and that there would be an elevation of who your God is in respectful worship and understanding the world in which we live in. Let's pray. Lord, thank you now for the time. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your great blessing to us. God, help us to keep your word. Work in our hearts and our lives now. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? So I see we have Mr. Schott and Mrs. Stefanko with us. What an exciting week for you. We're, 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 we're thrilled about that. Would you pray for us, sir, please?